what I'd like to speak with everyone today about is 3D printing of uh, medical devices, which, which really is uh, kind of a quiet uh, industrial revolution in the making, because it's not only changing the way we make devices, but it's starting to really change the way uh, medical practitioners treat their patients. So just a little bit of background about where I am right now. Onco Surgical was a company founded uh, about five years ago with a really singular focus on surgical oncology and treating patients that are uh, dealing with very serious bone conditions, whether it be uh, bone cancer, cartilage cancer, uh, or even just a, a revision surgery of an implant that's gone wrong from, from before. Um, we're developing a range of different technologies from 3D printing to digital platforms to antimicrobial surfaces, which is an area of focus for me right now. Uh, we do provide a variety of different devices that range from implants to biologics to personalized solutions, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, and that's kind of a snapshot of some of the stuff that we're working on uh, and getting off to the marketplace. So 3D printing, what is 3D printing? There's a lot of buzz out there. It's called additive manufacturing in some circles, but I think 3D printing is probably the more commonly known name for this technology. Uh, really, all it is is the creation of a physical object by successive layer deposition of a material where you're taking data from a three-dimensional digital model and converting that into a physical model. Um, it's really just another manufacturing technique, albeit a very, very powerful one and a very enabling one. <clears throat> and to give an example, um, if someone wanted to 3D print an image of a brain from an MRI, they would start off with an MRI, they would convert that MRI two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional uh, a computer model, that data would be then downloaded into a 3D printer. Uh, the printer would run uh, usually overnight and out would come a plastic model with relatively, uh, with an extremely close representation of the actual uh, 3D model of the image, of the 3D CAD model of the image. <clears throat> really, in a nutshell, 3D printing is, is just a very uh, uh, similar method to using Lego blocks to build up something, except here, the Lego blocks are quite small. They've got high resolution. With that, you can get some pretty incredible detail in components that you manufacture via 3D printing. So this is an example of, uh, uh, it's a rendering of a 3D printer, courtesy of Stratasys. I got this from the public domain on, on YouTube. Um, it's uh, quite telling as to how it works. So basically what you're looking at is a powder bed uh, in this case. Uh, you've got a machine that spreads over a layer of powder on top of another layer. A laser or some kind of high energy beam comes down, melts that powder together based on the computer model that it was fed. Uh, it happens very, very quickly and it happens one layer at a time. So again, the analogy to using uh, Lego blocks is quite similar. After the build is done, it looks kind of like an archaeological dig. You sweep away some of the powder and out comes a component which then is physically removed. It can be used as is, or it can be subjected to further processing, depending on what you want to do with it. So 3D printing has actually been around for about 40 years now. There are some major historical milestones that actually date back into the 19th century. Uh, there was a French artist that created 3D scanning using numerous cameras at various angles. Uh, in 1892, there was an inventor by the name of Joseph Lanther who invented wax layering, uh, where he built up and created these 3D topographical maps. In 1980, though, was really kind of when 3D printing became a little bit more mainstream, where Hideo Kodama, uh, he filed a patent to expose uh, photopolymers to UV light, which would then make solids uh, out of liquids, which was very interesting. About six years later, uh, Andrew, Le Andrew Lemahoff invented an application of lasers to make solid objects, again, layer by layer by layer, and he coined the term stereolithography. Uh, around the same time, Chuck Hall in the U.S. invented the application of U-Light and stereolithography in the USA, and he really spurred the commercialization and the creation of a very well-known company called 3D Systems, which really pioneered a lot of the 3D printed work. A year later, uh, Carl Deckard, he used lasers to melt powders layer by layer, very similar to that Stratasys example I showed you a few slides ago, and the term selective laser sintering was coined. Uh, and in 88, uh, Crump invented what's called fused deposition modeling, where basically you're kind of extruding out uh, some material, it and building up something, again, layer by layer. And that led to the creation of the company Stratasys. So there was, a big, there was a big jump in progress, obviously, from the 19th century to the late 1980s. Uh, and then it kind of got quiet and then suddenly took off about 10 or 15 years ago, again, in the early 2000s. 
So 3D printing can be broken down into about five uh, basic technology families. The first is material extrusion, uh, known as FDM, where basically you take a solid filament, uh, feed it through a roller, uh, that filament gets melted, you liquefy the filament material, and then you extrude it out and you build up a component layer by layer, very similar to the way a, uh, a Play-Doh extruder would, would be used. Another technology which, which I think is very interesting is VAT, photo, VAT photopolymerization or stereolithography, SLA or DLP are other acronyms that are thrown out there. And here what's happening is a laser source or a light source is hitting a reactive photopolymer and solidifying certain regions of it. And then that gets built up and pulled out of a tank uh, and you're left with a very elegant, very high precision uh, component with, with quite tight tolerances. A uh, very quick technology but it is really kind of limited to the world of polymers. Moving on, another 3D printing family is, uh, technology family is material jetting. Uh, this is basically very similar to 3D ink jetting. Uh, basically what you do here is you use a binder and a material, you lay down a powder, and then UV rays solidify and coagulate uh, those material powder particles together, forming a solid. Binder jetting is a very similar technology to material jetting, except here you're using either sand or metal and you're exposing it to a liquid binder, pulling out rather large components made out, of, uh, made out of metal. And then there's powder bed fusion. This is probably the most commonly used uh, application, certainly in the world of orthopedics. Um, powder bed fusion is very uh, similar. It is, frankly, the video that I showed you earlier uh, from Stratasys where layers of powder are melted. Uh, in the case of SLS, uh, one uses polymeric powder as they're hit by a laser, the powder particles sinter together, forming a solid component. SM or DMLS in the middle uses a laser to melt metallic powders, uh, forming very precise components. And then you've got electron beam technology or EBM, where instead of using a laser, use an electron beam to go down and basically do the same thing that a laser does. There's some advantages with the electron beam technology. It's very fast. Um, it's, it can also heat up a powder bed helping uh, engineers with something known as residual stress. When you heat up and melt materials too quickly, uh, what can happen is you can get a lot of warping and movement due to residual stresses from all that heat. Electron beam kind of helps dissipate that heat a little bit more evenly, it heats the bed. So a lot of nice details in there which really enable this technology to do certain things that lasers can't do. Okay, so switching gears, applications in the medical device health uh, healthcare stream. So, Industrial revolution, how is it defined? Really, it's the change in social and economic organization resulting from the general introduction of power-driven machinery or by an important change in the prevailing types and methods of use of such machines. So I would argue that 3D printing does present an industrial revolution, not only because the, the equipment is unique, uh, but also because it's changing the way patients are starting to treat their patients. Instead of getting mass-produced components, now a lot of medical practitioners can develop and use customized components because of the enabling nature of 3D printing. So let's go through some applications where 3D printing is commonly used these days. Um, anatomical models uh, is an area that's really taken off in the last few years. So one out of six surgeries have complications in the US. And uh, right now what's happening is the government, Medicare is transferring the financial burden of those complications to hospitals. So hospitals are financially becoming more and more on the hook to uh, compensate for any kind of issues or mistakes that might be made. So what are hospitals doing? What are one of the things hospitals are doing? They are turning to 3D printing to create models that would help them map and guide themselves through a surgery, kind of, kind of a three-dimensional map of what to do, where to go, what they're expecting to see. So the way it works is basically uh, software converts a 2D diagnostic image of an X-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI into a physical 3D model or a computer 3D model. That model is then printed on a printer. Sometimes it can be printed in color, sometimes not. And again, as I said, the models do present a systemic view of normal and diseased tissue. So a surgeon knows what to expect in a three-dimensional format before they go in and start operating on a patient. They can visualize, they can plan, they can practice, uh, and they can actually share this with patients' families or even the patients to give the patients a better idea of what's going on and what's going to happen. And what we're seeing now is that there are more and more dedicated modeling teams uh, popping up all over the country. You know, big institutions like the Mayo Clinic, they do well over 2,000 models a year to help them guide uh, some surgeries and surgical approaches, or at the very least to educate patients, other surgeons, and to prepare 
uh, you know, for future medical cases. So dental is another big area where 3D printing has just taken off. Um, you know, it starts off again with an intraoral or, or a scan uh, of a patient, of the patient's anatomy, of the patient's, uh, you know, issue that they're presenting with. Um, a 3D model, 3D model is then created from that, it's 3D printed. Orthodontic treatment, right now 3D printing is used very commonly to print actual, uh, uh, these align aligners, or they're used to print the models that then are used to cast some of these, uh, you know, orthodontic treatments. Crowns, <clears throat> excuse me, crowns, both temporary and permanent, are now being 3D printed, sometimes in, in, in dentist's office. I went to a, a dentist uh, a few weeks ago, and, and they had a unit that was actually 3D printing in their office. So instead of waiting a few weeks for a casting, you can have the crown done within a day or two, or even within the same visit. And the same goes for dentures and implants. So adoption of 3D printing in the dental field is now the second highest uh, in the medical device arena. It's projected to be a $9 billion market in 2027. So hearing aids. Hearing aids uh, is probably the biggest use right now of 3D printing in the medical arena. Um, ear anatomies are unique. Uh, back in the old days, everyone used to get pretty much the same hearing aid, and, and very often they were not comfortable. Yeah, I remember people complaining about them many years ago. Um, because ear anatomies are un unique, they do lend themselves to customized or patient-specific approaches. So in the case of hearing aids, uh, the ear anatomy is laser scanned, or you can conduct a, or do a mold impression to get the specific dimensions of a person's uh, uh, ear anatomy. And then a customized polymer shell is 3D printed, usually through the, uh, the photopolymerization technique. Electronics are then integrated, so that's not automated yet. That's not part of the 3D, 3D printing process. And right now, because of that, within about 10 to 15 years, hearing aids went from being all standard production to being all now effectively 3D printed and effectively custom made for patients in the US. And there's about 10 million hearing aids in use right now in the, uh, in, within the US that are 3D printed. So remote area devices is another area that's, that's growing in 3D printing. And this is one that could truly enable some of the poorer countries um, and that don't have access to good medical health care and good medical uh, value uh, uh, supply chains. So basically the way it works is, is someone could use a small compact mobile, possibly solar powered 3D printer. Um, you could print very simple components, you know, finger splints, foot splints, arm splints. Um, again, this could help tremendously in remote, remote impoverished areas. It can help in military fields of operations. Um, I've heard stories where various navies throughout the world, instead of building up and uh, taking on uh, tons of inventory gears, um, things of that nature, they can now go ahead and load up a 3D printer onto a, a ship. And if something breaks, if a bolt breaks or if a gear breaks, uh, if a nut breaks, they can go and 3D print it on demand. So they don't have to load up their ships with high inventory, which obviously takes up weight, becomes ballast and becomes an issue. So they just go with the 3D printer. So that's kind of another example, albeit not in the medical device arena of remote area devices and re remote area 3D printing. Okay, point of care printing is kind of a continuation of that. Um, again, you know, what's happening is a lot of hospitals are now starting to look at not only printing models, but they're starting to evaluate whether or not they can print their own devices. Uh, you know, uh, jigs for surgeries, possibly even someday implants. Um, it is common right now for models and prototypes, very simple devices, now dental. Uh, what that does require though, is it requires hospitals to have a team of engineers. They have to have a radiologist working with a team of engineers, a segmenting engineer who takes the model and then breaks it down into specific layers, cleans it up a little bit. Currently, this is not reimbursed. Um, but it is moving in that direction. And this is an area that the FDA is starting to look at because um, hospitals are not medical device uh, manufacturers and they are slowly becoming enabled to obtain that status. Um, what would be interesting though is, you know, hospitals would have to be careful there because they'd have to establish possibly independent companies with regulatory and quality oversight for, for legal reasons. So that's kind of a paradigm shift where I think, you know, part of the industrial revolution definition of 3D, print 3D printing is, is kind of manifesting itself. All right, then there's the area of patient-specific printing or customized printing. So mass customization, leveraging advanced imaging and 3D printing is, is slowly becoming a reality. Um, some of these compassionate use implants have really had a dramatic impact on patients. Um, some of the images here on the left, you know, that's a tracheal splint, uh, which saved a, a child's life many, many years ago. Uh, that was, again, I believe, a compassionate use. The FDA granted approval 
uh, for the company to help a hospital and that patient get that implant. Um, there are also surgical guides, right? So right now with the, uh, the precision of 3D printing, one can create these jigs and align these jigs very precisely to fit onto uh, bone or other patient anatomies for improved preparations, for, for, for improved you know, drilling of holes and cutting away of bone segments uh, with great, great precision. So instead of a surgeon eyeballing it, now you've got these customized patient-specific jigs that are enabling a surgeon to make very precise cuts. And then, of course, there's unique implants like the one on the right here. That was made by a company out of New Zealand, um, and that was a customized rib cage uh, that was actually very complex and printed on an e-beam printer. The great thing about these patient-specific uh, printing options is that they are out there helping a lot of people. Unfortunately, it is a little bit difficult to get clinical efficacy data because there's a lot of variability from patient to patient and device to device. So they do typically come, uh, and they are typically used uh, more on a life-saving, uh, for a life-saving event or for a dramatic uh, quality of life improvement, uh, except for the center example where you've got some of these patient-specific jigs, which are becoming more and more commonly used. So moving on to bioprinting. Now, this is an area that's, that's pretty hot right now. There's a lot of discussions, a lot of, a lot of chatter out there. Um, and it is an area that 3D printing is going to be able to uniquely help out, but I don't think for a while just yet. Um, there's about 20 people that die every day in the U.S. due to lack of organs. Uh, donated tissue and organ availability is definitely a challenge. Not that many people are willing to donate their loved ones or their own tissue or organs after they pass away. So tissue printing is, is uniquely uh, positioned here to satisfy a market that's got a huge amount of demand but not enough supply. And there's a variety of different 3D printing, bioprinting options out there, but basically in a nutshell, the way it works is cells and nutrients are printed out onto a scaffold, which could also be 3D printed previously, and then over time, viable tissue is synthesized on that scaffold using the scaffold as a substrate and as a catalyst. Um, I could see tissue printing kind of moving into the realm of uh, being used for drug and therapeutics development, so for testing of drugs. Um, there is some talk about in-situ or on-the-spot bioprinting of skin, um, but I do think that organ printing is still at least 10 years away. Uh, I think that's a very complicated area. There's still a lot of development to be done. Not, not only that, but to mention, uh, it's also important to mention that, you know, regulatory constraints uh, as to how you'd be managing a synthetic organ is going to be very interesting and very telling. So that's kind of a good segue into the regulatory environment around 3D printing. So the FDA has been involved in 3D printing for the last 10 years. Um, they've been talking with industry. They've been meeting with industry. Um, they did issue a very good F guidance document, which is really guiding a lot of companies as to how to do their development and testing of 3D printed medical devices. It's quite thorough. Uh, the FDA already cleared well over 100 3D printed devices. So there's stuff out there that's being implanted left and right that's been 3D printed. Uh, the FDA has a very good research and engineering lab, which interfaces very closely, not only with reviews and give clearances or approvals for these 3D printed components. Um, the FDA has also enabled formal outreach through something called the ELP, the Educational Learning Program, where the FDA actually goes out and learns from companies that are expert in 3D printing about some of the nuances and pitfalls about the technology. I've personally been involved in a few of these things, and they're great. They're really fantastic. Um, the FDA has highly trained reviewers that are not only trained by their engineers uh, at the FDA Research and Engineering Lab, but also they're very experienced because they have cleared quite a few devices out there, and there's a lot of activity in this realm. Um, they also have a wonderful pre-submission program, which was talked about earlier uh, today in our, in our conference, where the FDA can go ahead and take a look at what you're proposing to submit and the testing that you're proposing to perform and give you feedback. And everything I'm saying here for the FDA is applicable to overseas regulatory agencies as well. They don't have the FDA research and engineering laboratories, but they're quite competent and they're quite experienced in getting a lot of these 3D printing components cleared in Asia as well as uh, in Europe. All of the European landscape from a regulatory perspective is obviously changing. I think, as I mentioned before, some areas that are, are going to be interesting for the FDA to regulate is hospital point of care 3D printing. I know the FDA has been very active in this realm for the last two or three years. Uh, they're interfacing and talking with industry and hospitals to make sure they manage this well. And then obviously bioprinting. Uh, the FDA regulates devices. They don't regulate organs. So what happens when an organ is 3D printed? Is it going to be an organ or is, there, or is it going to be regulated as a device? So some interesting questions, I think, coming up for the FDA. 
So moving on, I want to focus a little bit on orthopedics. Um, orthopedics is a big device market. That's where my company uh, plays right now. Uh, it was about a $56 billion market in 2019. Uh, it's got a compounded annual growth rate of about 4%. Obviously, this year with COVID, things are going to slow down a little bit. The U.S. does account for about 50% of market share, and it's driven by an aging population uh, as well as demanding patients. Um, spine trauma, hip and knee replacements account for about half of that market. And titanium is the material of choice for both hip, spine, and trauma these days. So titanium and hips, uh, this is an area that's really been a big success story. Titanium started in the 50s. It was inspired by dental applications uh, and started in the 50s in terms of medical devices. Um, prior to titanium, hip stems were predominantly made of cobalt chromium alloy and stainless steel alloys, and they were predominantly cemented. They were glued into place, as shown on the right, where you see that femur. But research started pointing to improved bone fixation, so bone on growth to titanium. And hip implants went for a redesign for better bone inter uh, interaction integration. Um, and people started spraying hip implants with these rough titanium coatings, or they started sintering on these coatings to them. And what they saw was that bone actually started integrating or started growing on and locking into the titanium. So the need for gluing these stems disappeared and titanium became the standard of care and hip replacement. And right now the world of 3D printing is beginning to smash paradigms in, in the world of, of, uh, of hips. Um, why did device makers get into 3D printing? It was really for one reason or predominantly one reason. They wanted to create these porous bone ingrow surfaces shown on the bottom here uh, from Zimmer. Uh, these were very difficult porous structures to create using standard techniques of plasma spraying, creating rough coatings. They wouldn't create that three-dimensional space for bone to potentially ingrow into. So that's what 3D printing kind of stepped in and did very easily. Um, and now suddenly with 3D printing, very complex designs of previously unmanufacturable titanium hip implants were created. Um, so again, I think it's important to note here that 3D printing of titanium orthopedic implants is being used in, uh, are, are the, sorry, they're complex in design, but these are standard mass produced offerings. These are not only being done on a patient specific basis, but they're actually being implanted into tens of thousands of people today. And they're coming off production lines in a standard format. They're not made to order, which is I think a big, big paradigm shift and not what people expected from 3D printing about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so again, just to reiterate what I said before, thermal spraying created two-dimensional surfaces, 3D printing created these porous three-dimensional in-road surfaces that are shown down here. Um, and 3D printing now is becoming used all over uh, the hip and it's becoming a real popular thing to do. Um, there is a little bit of hesitation in using it for some of the higher fatigue uh, applications. And there's a lot of development going on to enhance the fatigue strength of some of these components to make sure it can be used everywhere in the hip replacement. So moving on, titanium 3D printing of knees. This is a success story in the making. Um, knees are still predominantly cobalt chromium and they're cemented about 80 to 85% of the time. And the reason for that is knee surgery is more complex than hip surgery. There's a lot of different bone cuts and there's a lot of soft tissue manipulation. And possibly because of that, but really for reasons unknown, uh, patient satisfaction uh, for, hip, for knee replacements are about 80%. By contrast, patient satisfaction when you get a new hip is about 95%. So there's still some ground to make up in the knee procedure. And right now what's happening is companies are starting to 3D print porous surfaces, again, as shown in that middle image of a knee, uh, and using 3D printing to create very unique design features. And the early clinical outcomes are, are quite positive. So there's probably a market shift that's going to be happening where knees are going to be coming more and more uh, 3D printed, and they'll be 3D printed very likely in titanium, uh, which presents about a $4 billion market opportunity for the, for the industry. So spine, uh, 3D printing of spine is, is a story of a changing market. You know, spinal fusion, basically when someone's got a bad disc and they've got severe back pain, what that often requires at the last stages is spinal fusion, where the diseased disc is removed and the uh, intervertebral, intervertebral bodies are fused together and something is placed in between the intervertebral bodies. Um, and what goes into that space or space, as it's called, has been evolving over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. In the 1990s, surgeons would screw in something called an anodized titanium um, uh, uh, spacer. Uh, in the 2000s, that shifted over to allograft bone to actually using bone from a bone bank. In the 2010s, polyether ether ketone, so a polymeric component was used there. And right now, 3D printing of titanium spacers is ubiquitous. That's what every company is basically doing. 
Uh, and again, what 3D printing brings here is unique design features that can't be made with any other technology, as, along with this porous structure for bone to grow through and grow into. Um, so this has gone mainstream. Uh, a lot of the big orthopedic players, Stryker, Zimmer, Johnson & Johnson, are now 3D printing their intrabody spacers for the spinal market. So let me just pause here and just talk about some 3D printing commercial considerations. So from a big picture perspective, 3D printing, despite all the talk and all the press that it's getting, it's still a relatively small market. It's about a $16 billion business in 2019. Uh, and that's all 3D printing. That's not just medical, that's, that's uh, aerospace and, and other automotive and other general industries. It is, however, growing rather rapidly at about 26%. Now, granted, COVID hit this year, so that number probably took a bit of a hit uh, for 2020, but it, it is expected to bounce back. 3D printing of medical devices is a very small market. It's only about a $1.6 billion market. So all the providers of, of materials, of, of, of implants to the OEMs, uh, to equipment is still a relatively strong, small market, but it's growing at about 18% a year. Um, what we've seen though happen a lot, and I think this is because of what's happening in hips, knees, and spine, is metal 3D printers sales grew about 80% in 2017. So before that, most of the 3D printing uh, equipment used by medical device manufacturers printed polymers, but in 2017, there was an inflection point where now suddenly metal printing has, starting to, has started to go very mainstream for a lot of these orthopedic markets. There are some gaps in the industry. Demand is outpacing supply. Um, there are not that many qualified contract manufacturers and there's not enough, it is growing, but there's still not enough qualified technical talent out there. So really what's the future for 3D printing? Um, you know, it is a large, but it is a niche market. And really I think 3D printing should be used in my opinion where you can manufacture designs that were previously unmanufacturable uh, due to the limits of various older manufacturing technologies like casting and forging. Mass customization is certainly a maybe, uh, but the clinical benefit's gonna have to outweigh the cost here. Some of these customized implants can get rather expensive. Smart devices integrating electronics into 3D printing in situ, I think is certainly an area that people are looking at right now. And I think, you know, cost. Cost is a big barrier. Some of these pieces of equipment, they can run up to a million dollars. And that's a lot of money for small companies. And it's a lot of money for big companies if you've got to buy 30 or 40 of these things to keep up with your demand. So I think people have to be on the lookout for inexpensive 3D printers, especially coming from China, um, where you know quality is going to be improving and has been improving. So let me just stop uh, with kind of a success story at our company, Oncos. You know, we have something called My3D Personalized Solutions, where we work with surgeons side by side, our engineers uh, download an image from a surgeon. And in this case, on the upper left, uh, it's a photo or it's an, it's a, it's an MRI of a, uh, of a tumor growing on the lower part of the knee. Um, what we do is we accept those images, we render them, we convert them into a 3D model. Uh, and then based off of that model, we designed effectively a cutting guide that a surgeon can use to cut away the diseased bone, make sure the margins are good to make sure you cut away uh, any potential areas that the cancer can actually grow into into the bone. Um, using uh, some of that 3D modeling, we then create these 3D instruments, which enable the surgeon, as I said earlier, to make very precise cuts. And then using that same type of instrumentation, uh, we can use that uh, to create another guide or jig to cut out allograft, a bone from a donor, again, very precisely. And the end solution really is a patient that's got a patient-matched piece of allograft, uh, of allograft bone that attaches and integrates very, very precisely with their own bone. In the old days, prior to these types of solutions, a surgeon would have to hand cut the bone on the patient, and they would have to then hand cut the allograft bone coming from a donor as well. And the fit would not always be that good. It wouldn't be that precise. So we're hoping that this will uh, improve clinical outcomes for the patients that we deal with. So in conclusion, uh, I think 3D printing has certainly created some tectonic business model shifts, especially in the dental and hearing aid device arenas. Uh, anatomical models have really helped surgeons improve some of their surgical outcomes. Customized implants have dramatically improved. And in fact, I think we could even say saved numerous lives or certainly saved some lives, but improved numerous lives. Point of care 3D printing, I think, is going to bring devices to, ho to hospitals and developing nations and regions that really need it. Bioprinting is certainly on the horizon, but I think it's still a decade away, speaking realistically. Um, I think a great thing that's happened in the last five to 10 years is that regulatory agencies understand and they embrace this technology. 
At first, I think they were a little bit cautious, but once they learned that this is just another manufacturing technology, um, albeit a very enabling technology, I think regulatory agencies are understanding it and they're clearing products uh, rather easily, as long as you apply the scrutiny and you do all the testing that's required to the, uh, to the devices that you're developing. Uh, 3D printing of titanium has gone mainstream. Uh, again, it's being used not only on a customized basis, but it's being used to manufacture parts and have parts come off of a production line the way metal parts used to be cast or, 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 or forged uh, in a plant. Now you've got 3D printers, you know, dozens and dozens of them running 24 seven, creating standardized product, which are being implanted in people all the time. But it's still an untapped market and it's certainly a market that's gonna be growing in the, in the double digits in the near future. And that is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gene. Any quest coming in? I just had one before you go, Gene, and we bring the next speakers on. Um, I'm thinking about reliability of the units. And so, you know, thinking of, I guess, 3D printing, whether it's metals or a type of polymer as uh, a milled sort of um, artifice, What's the reliability been compared to something that's forged or cast uh, in the same kind of material? So let's say steel to steel or titanium to titanium. Yeah, great question, Ben. So, so you know, 10 years ago, uh, there were not a lot of good manufacturers out there. They were just starting off and the equipment was quite unreliable. In the last 10 years, it's, it's improved dramatically um, where it is approaching the uh, accuracy and precision or precision, I guess you may want to say, or accuracy perhaps based on your last talk of casting and of forging. Um, there are some areas that still need to be machined if you wanna get an improved surface finish, but they're quickly converging on castings and on forging. Uh, they're not quite there yet, they're just about there. Um, as I said, if there are some rough areas, like for instance, some of these porous ingrowth areas where you, know, you don't need a lot of precision, uh, you, know, you don't need micron precision, and then it's equivalent to casting and forging. If you've got some areas that you've got thousand, you know, you've got a one ten thousandth type of tolerance, then you would have to go and touch that up with a machining operation, just as you would with a forging or a casting operation. But basically it's converging, if not already there, as compared to casting and forging and other traditional um, fabrication technologies. Obviously it's not as accurate as CNC machining, nothing really is. So it's, it's getting there. Yeah, great feedback, thank you. Thank you.